Good evening viewers and aspirants. Welcome to the Hindi News Analysis by Shankara AS Academy for the date 6th of August 2021. These are the list of news articles taken for today's discussion. Today also we have topics from different areas of our syllabus. So don't miss this discussion. Let us move on to the first news article. Our first discussion is going to be based on this news article. It mentions that Rajya Sabha has passed three bills and one among them is the constitution scheduled tribes order amendment bill of 2021 and note that this bill is concerned with the list of scheduled tribes in arunachal pradesh so today we are going to see about the bill and the proposed changes and we will also briefly see about some of the tribes the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference first you should know that indian constitution defines scheduled tribes they are defined under article 366 clause 25 and as per this article scheduled tribes are those communities that are scheduled in accordance to the article 342 of the constitution so what is this article 342 this article specifies that the president may specify the tribe or tribal communities or even parts of those tribes or tribal communities or groups within these tribes or tribal communities to be scheduled tribes for the purposes of the constitution that means the major tribes and their sub tribes may be specified by the president as a scheduled tribe under the constitution and this provision is applicable with respect to any state or union territory additionally note that in case of states specifying a tribe as a scheduled tribe can only be done after consultation with the governor of that state and that to buy a public notification so this was as per the clause 1 of article 342 now according to clause 2 the parliament may by law include or even exclude from the list of scheduled tribes specified in the notification which is issued under clause 1 so that means the first specification of uh, scheduled tribes in relation to a particular state or union territory is done by a notified order of the president and that too after consultation with the state governments concerned but these orders can be modified subsequently only through an act of parliament so in this regard only president passed an order called as constitution scheduled tribes order of 1950 and under this order the scheduled tribes of many states were mentioned so after that whenever the parliament wanted to include or exclude a scheduled tribe from the list then it passes a amendment bill so in this purpose only the current bill has also been passed and it also amends the constitution scheduled tribes order of 1950 now this amendment seeks to change the constitutional list of scheduled tribes as recommended by the arunachal pradesh states so it will obviously amend the list of scheduled tribes in that state so these are the existing scheduled tribes in the arunachal pradesh state now in this table you can see the proposed changes to this list as you can see the abhor tribe of arunachal pradesh has been removed from this scheduled tribes list of arunachal pradesh and apart from that the bill also seeks to replace certain tribes mentioned in the original list so for example the kamti tribe has been replaced by thai kamti tribe and similarly in place of any naga tribes the bill proposes to mention nokte tangsa tutsa and wancho tribe so just have a look at it you should primarily know that all these tribes belong to the state of arunachal pradesh and since there are many tribes today we have taken four important tribes in the state to discuss so let us see them one by one now first let us talk about the abhor tribe and i hope that i am pronouncing the names of these tribes correctly if i am incorrect i apologize now note that the abhor tribe is also known as the adi people it is because the language spoken by this tribal community is adi and the main occupation of this community is agriculture especially the wet rice cultivation is practiced by this people therefore they also possess a significant agricultural economy and the staple food of this tribal group includes wheat and rice and the important festival of the abhor tribe is the harvest festival of solong this solong festival is celebrated to seek huge growth of crops in the forthcoming year so regarding a tribe we should know to which state they belong to and what is their occupation or their main cultural habit and their important festivals folk dances if any exists etc etc so don't go deep into the cultural aspects just know these important facts because prelims questions are framed on these facts only now let us take the thai kamti tribe these tribes have got a distinct rich and unparalleled cultural heritage until now it has remained unexplored i note that thai kamti is the only tribe in the state to be known to have their own script 
and this script is called by the people as Thai script or the Lik Thai. Now, what about their occupation? See, these people are settled agriculturalists, and they practice both jhum cultivation and settled agriculture. And they are also known for their kamti dance. This dance reflects the rich culture of Buddhists, and it even unfolds the myths and stories of moral values. Now, their important festival is Sangkhen Festival, which is also known as the Water Festival. See, this is a socio-religious festival observed by the Theravada Buddhist sect. This festival is celebrated at the advent of the spring season every year, and it corresponds with the Sankranti of Baisak. This festival indicates the end of the old season and the advent of the new season, and it is also known as Water Festival because people pour water over each other to express goodwill. So, this practice is also a part of their cleansing. Sing ritual before the advent of New Year. Now the next important tribe is the Idu Mishmi tribe. See, they are a major sub tribe of the Mishmi group. The Idu Mishmi tribe have their own dialect, and this dialect falls under the Tibeto-Burman group of languages. And the Idu Mishmi people are experts in handicrafts and weaving, and they even practice both uh, terrace cultivation and even the wet rice cultivation. Now their important festival is Re. This is a festival where the devotees offer worship to the Divine Mother Nani Inithaya. They believe that they celebrate this festival to express the bond of brotherhood. And the last important tribe that we are going to discuss today is the Wancho tribe. See, Wancho tribes majorly inhabit in the Longding and Tirab districts in the state of Arunachal Pradesh. And the Wancho tribes are culturally Nagas, but they are ethnically related to the Nokte and Konyak Naga tribes who belong to the Mon district and Tirab district. I know that the Wancho language belongs to the Tibeto-Burman family. Most importantly, the Wancho tribe are known for their tattooing and the prime festival of Ancho is Oraya. It is celebrated between March to April for a period of 6 to 12 days. And during this festival, villagers exchange bamboo tubes filled with rice beer as a mark of greeting and goodwill. One important fact from the prelims point of view that you should note is that Wancho is listed as a vulnerable language under the UNESCO's Atlas of World Languages in Danger. So remember this fact. So that is all. Today in this discussion we saw about a proposed legislation that aims to make changes to the scheduled tribes list of Arunachal Pradesh. And we saw about four important tribes, Abhor tribe, Thai Kamti tribe, Idumishmi tribe and Wancho tribe. Now let us move on to the next discussion. Our next discussion is going to be based on this news article which mentions about the response from the Mauritius government. Mauritius has told that it does not plan to make the Agalega Island as an Indian military base. See this response from Mauritius is due to a news report which mentioned that India is building a military base in the Agalega Island which is a Mauritian island. See, the contentious news report mentioned that two projects, namely an airstrip and two jetties are being constructed by India on this island. But regarding this, but this claim has been denied by the Mauritius government and also by the Indian officials. They have noted that Mauritius and India does not have any agreement for the creation of any military base in Aglega. And the two projects which are being constructed were agreed during Indian Prime Minister's visit to Mauritius in 2015. And these two projects would not be used for military purposes. So this was the government's response. So that means this Agalega is in spotlight now and that is why we are going to discuss about this island today and also about Mauritius. First let us start with Mauritius. It is the island country in the Indian Ocean. It is situated in the southwest of Indian Ocean and particularly the island lies south of equator. It is also located off the eastern coast of Africa and as you can see in this map it lies about 800 kilometers east of Madagascar. You can see the size of Madagascar and this Mauritius island and you can compare how small is Mauritius. Now note that this island is of volcanic origin and it also forms part of the group of islands which are commonly known as the Mascarines. Now this island also has certain outlying territories. Outlying means they are situated far from the main island. Now these territories include the Rodrigues Island which is situated to the east of the main island of Mauritius and note that Rodrigues Island is the smallest of the Mascarene Archipelago and the next outlying territory is the Cargadas Karajos Shoals this is situated to the northeast of the main island and next comes the Agalega it is situated to the north of the main island and apart from these three Mauritius also claims sovereignty over the Chagos Archipelago Chagos is situated to the northwest of the main island but note that this claim is disputed by Britain which claims Chagos as a British overseas territory. 
Now coming back to Mauritius, uh, its capital is Port Louis and from a topography perspective, note that the island is almost entirely surrounded by coral reefs as you can see in this map. Another important fact is that Mauritius is the former home of Dodo. See this Dodo is a large flightless bird related to the pigeons but this bird was driven to extinction by the end of 17th century and this happened due to hunting and uh, introduction of predatory species in the Mauritius island. Now next, the two important rivers of the island are Grand River, Southeast River and the Black River. But today our focus is on the Agalega. See, Agalega is actually a atoll. Atoll means a ring-shaped reef or island or even a chain of islands which is formed of coral. So this Agalega Atoll is situated at around 1000 kilometers north of Mauritius main island and this Agalega consists of two islands, the North Island and the South Island and totally they have a population of around 360. The only resource available on this island is coconut which is widely available. It is available to the extent that there are around 70,000 standing coconut trees which are distributed over 500 hectares of the island. This is around 20% of the total surface area of the island. So because of this for a longer period of time the most important activity of the people of this island was to supply coconut oil and copra to Mauritius. Now apart from this Aglega also faces certain specific problems which are caused by factors such as uh, it is small then it is remotely located it has frail ecosystems it lacks regular transport and communication and it has inadequate natural resources and there is also limited freshwater supplies and they even heavily depend on imports from the Mauritius. So these are some of the facts that you need to know about Mauritius and Aglega. As a conclusion we can say that if as per the news reports Aglega becomes a uh, Indian military base then this will establish India's presence in the Southwest Indian Ocean as well and this will facilitate India's power projection aspirations in the region. So with this we have come to the end of this discussion now let us move on to the next one. Now let us take up this news article which is from Bangalore edition. It mentions that due to heavy rain, the Gold Gumbas has been damaged. So what is this Gold Gumbas? So it is the most famous monument in Vijayapura of Karnataka. Vijayapura is now known as Bijapur. And this Gold Gumbas is the tomb of Muhammad Adil Shah or we can say it is the mausoleum of Muhammad Adil Shah. As you know, Muhammad Adil Shah is the seventh ruler of the Adil Shahi dynasty and this tomb was built by him. Actually it was constructed by the architect Yakut of Dabul. Its construction started in 1626 and it was finished in 1656. This tomb is 210 feet high and you should note that this is our country's largest dome and most importantly it is the second largest dome ever built and it is unsupported by pillars. See the first largest dome is the St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City of Rome and this is the second largest dome and this dome and tomb they reflect the Deccan style of architecture. Now totally this Gold Gumbas complex includes a mosque, a Nakkar Khana and the ruins of guest houses. See here Nakkar Khana means a hall for trumpeteers and now this hall is being used as a museum. Now this tomb has seven storied octagonal spires at the four corners and there is a particular attraction in this monument which is its acoustics. If we see its central chamber here every sound is echoed more than seven times. Another attraction at Gold Gumbas is the whispering gallery where even minute sounds can be heard clearly 37 meters away. So that means this Gold Gumbas is constructed in such a way that even a pin drop can be heard distinctly from across a space of 38 meters. So these are the important few facts that you need to know about Gold Gumbas. Now let us move to the next discussion which is based on this news article. This news article reports about the launch of an Earth observation satellite. See according to the news the Indian Space Research Organization that is ISRO is about to launch an Earth observation satellite from the Satish Dhawan Space Center situated at Sri Harikota. And according to the news this Earth observation satellite which is named as EOS-03, it will be placed in a geosynchronous transfer orbit and it will be placed by the GSLV F10. Now here you should know about this EOS-03. It is a modern advanced agile satellite. It will enable real-time monitoring of natural disasters, water bodies, crops, forest cover changes, etc. etc. Now another important fact to be noted about this mission is that it uses an ogive shaped payload fairing of 4 meter diameter and this is being flown for the first time in this GSLV flight. See in this the term Ogai shaped refers to the head of a projectile or the nose cone of a rocket and the term payload fairing refers to an equipment that is used for protecting the spacecraft and for protecting the third stage of the mission. 
so both these together gives protection against the aerodynamic forces from the atmosphere and that is why this is a special feature of this mission so keeping these facts in mind let us generally say about the earth observation satellites so what are these so they are also known as earth remote sensing satellites these satellites are used or designed for the purpose of observing the earth from the orbit and usually these satellites are intended for non military uses only so for various purposes a variety of instruments have been flown on board these satellites and these instruments provide necessary data in a diversified resolutions and if you see generally the data from these satellites are used for several applications as we already saw and these applications range across areas like uh, agriculture urban planning mineral prospecting ocean resources and disaster management so in this regard let us see some of the important earth observation satellites of india this includes the cartosat satellite series then risat 1 oceansat etc see in this the cartosat 1 is the first indian remote sensing satellite that was capable of providing in orbit stereo images and the whole series of cartosat they have high resolution imaging sensors and these are primarily intended for applications in the mapping purposes and next comes the risat 1 in this risat stands for radar satellite it is a state of the art microwave remote sensing satellite it has got the potential to work during both day and night under all weather conditions and this is the advantage of this satellite as it provides applications in cloud penetration and also provides day night imaging capability now the next important earth observation satellite is the IRS P4 in this IRS P stands for Indian Remote Sensing Program satellite and here P4 is the ocean sat so as the name suggests this satellite was first primarily built for ocean applications so this satellite carries ocean color monitor and a multi frequency scanning microwave radiometer for oceanographic studies so remember the names of these satellites these are earth observation satellites in this discussion we saw about the EOS 03 and also about other earth observation satellites now let us move to the next discussion Our next discussion is going to be based on this snippet article from Tiruvannadapuram edition of Hindi newspaper. This news article mentions that one of the events of Onam called as Pulikali is not going to be held in this year also and this is due to the existing COVID-19 restrictions. So today let us see about this Pulikali. Before that just know that Onam is the festival of Kerala and it celebrates the reminiscence of the prosperous times of Mahabali. And for the last several centuries Onam has been a grand national harvest festival in which all sections of the people participate. And there are some important events in the Onam festival. They are the Pookalam, Pulikali, Uriyadi etc. In this Pookalam means flower rangoli then uriyadi means breaking the pot now among these the most important folk art is the pulikali it stands for tiger dance and note that this folk art is very common in the trishur district of kerala as you know trishur is the cultural capital of kerala so let us see about pulikali now as you already saw pulikali stands for tiger dance actually literally puli means leopard and kali means play So this pulikali is a dance form based on the human recreation of the movement of tigers to a particular rhythm. We know that Onam is a 10-day festival between the Attam and Tiruvonam days and according to some sources pulikali is mainly celebrated on the 4th day of the festival. So in this folk art the artists paint their bodies like tigers that is they paint their bodies with stripes of yellow red and black then they dance to the rhythm of traditional percussion instruments such as takil uduk and chenda this is the takil uduk and chenda and during this festival human tigers appear in various unique hues and masks along with the locals and visitors now the main theme of this folk card is tiger hunting where the participants play the role of tiger and also the hunter now these leopard faces are drawn on bellies of the artists and note that this makeup is applied using oil paints and it is said to be extremely hard to remove so every year this folk art used to draw people from around the world another important fact to be noted is that pulikali was mainly performed by men but the festival has made headlines in the last few years when women also started participating in it but still the group comprises of uh, male leopards uh, predominantly and there are only few female and child leopards and as we already said pulikali is a mast festival therefore there is no significance for facial expressions in this folk art So these are some of the few important facts that you need to know about this folk art of Pulikali. Now let us move on to the next discussion. Okay now let us take up this news article. It talks about the Essential Defence Services Bill of 2021. This bill was introduced in the Lok Sabha by the Union Minister of Defence 
and it was introduced in July 2021. Here you should note that this bill seeks to replace the Essential Defence Services Ordinance that was promulgated by the President in June 2021. Now regarding this bill, a clarification has been given by an official of Defence Ministry where he has said that even now the employees have the right to peaceful protest because the bill does not come into effect unless it is invoked. So this is what is mentioned in the news article. So why this statement was made by the official? This is because the bill is meant to provide for the maintenance of essential defense services so as to secure the security of nation and the life and property of public. So for this purpose, it prohibits employees from going on a strike. See, the primary objective of the bill is to prevent the staff of government-owned ordnance factories from going on a strike. What are these ordnance factories? See, the Indian ordnance factories are the oldest and largest industrial setup that is functioning under the Department of Defense Production of Ministry of Defense. These ordnance factories form an integral base for indigenous production of defense hardware and equipment. So the primary objective such ordnance ordnance factories is achieving self-reliance in equipping the armed forces with state-of-the-art battlefield equipment. So in simple terms, we can say that the equipments and defense hardwares used by the armed forces are produced in these ordnance factories only. I note that there are 41 ordnance factories around the country and around 70,000 people work there. So that means this bill prevents these 70,000 employees from going on a strike. So today, let us limit the discussion with respect to this strike aspect only. In this regard, let us first see certain features of the bill. First, we need to know what are the the essential defense services. The essential defense services includes any service in any establishment that is dealing with production of goods required for the defense related purposes. And it also includes any establishment of the armed forces or the establishment that is connected with defense of our country. In addition to this, the bill also states that the Indian government may also declare any service as an essential defense service if its cessation or termination will affect the production of defense equipment or the operation of industrial establishment which is engaged in such production. So, for example, if a factory exists and its running is important for production of defense equipment, then any service in that establishment can be declared as an essential defense service. Now, most importantly, the bill also describes what is a strike. See, according to the bill, the cessation of work, sit down, stay in, token strike, sympathetic strike or mass casual leave by persons who are engaged in essential defense services, all of these are strike. Apart from this, strike also includes refusal to work overtime if such work is necessary for the maintenance of essential defense services. So what is the power provided to the central government under the bill? The bill empowers the government to prohibit strikes in essential defense services and to that effect the central government can pass an order and such an order has to be issued in the interest of sovereignty and integrity of India or uh, in the interest of security of any state or in the interest of public order public interest etc and such an prohibition order if it is passed it will remain in force for six months and depending on the circumstances the central government may also extend the order for another six months so now you may have a question as to whether whether striking is a right in India or not. So for this, we need to understand the status of right to strike in India. Here you should remember that in India, right to protest is a fundamental right under Article 19 of Constitution of India. But right to strike is not a fundamental right, rather it is a legal right. And this legal right also comes with certain statutory restrictions which are attached to it through the Industrial Dispute Act of 1947. For example, this section 22 of the Act provides for prohibition of strikes and lockouts and it describes many scenarios where a strike cannot happen. For example, if you see here, a person employed in public utility service cannot go on a strike without giving the notice of strike to the employer within six weeks before striking. So similarly, certain conditions apply to this legal right to strike. So remember these facts, these are important from prelims perspective because often in prelims we get a question where the question asks us to identify a right as whether it is a fundamental right, a legal right, constitutional right, etc. So be careful while attending such questions. We will see other aspects and other important provisions of this bill some other day. Today, let us wrap up this discussion on Essential Defense Services Bill of 2021. Now, let us take up the next news article. Next discussion is based on this news article which is an interview that tells us the association of COVID-19 and pregnancy. So generally itself, 
pregnancy and childbirth is a phase where the individual is vulnerable to disease and even the prognosis is also slightly bad due to the stress that the body undergoes due to pregnancy prognosis is the likely course of a medical condition so due to this the interview says that although pregnancy doesn't increase the risk of acquiring the covid-19 disease the complication associated with pregnancy could be higher due to that this has been said based on the fact that complications like premature births cesareans all of these uh, went up during the second wave of covid-19 pandemic and this is the reason why pregnant women need to be vaccinated so this is what the article says so since now we have come across vaccinations from exam perspective especially from the preliminary exam point of view let us look into the other vaccinations for children and pregnant women before that let us understand vaccines briefly see the principle of vaccination or immunization is based on the property of memory of the immune system as you know a vaccine is generally prepared using an antigenic protein of the pathogen or it uses inactivated pathogen or even weakened pathogen so through vaccination such a vaccine is introduced into the body so antibodies are produced in a response to these proteins of pathogen or inactivated and weakened pathogen so through this response a memory is created in our body's immune system so the antibodies which is produced in the body against these antigens neutralizes the pathogenic agents during the actual infection apart from this function the vaccines also generate certain memory b cells and t cells see these b cells and t cells are the immune white cells and they recognize the pathogen quickly on subsequent exposure to that pathogen so when these b cells and t cells come in contact with the pathogen in our body they immediately react to that invading microorganism with the massive production of antibodies but there are also some deadly microbes to which quick immune response is required so if a person is infected with that deadly microbe then for that only immunization program of a country is important for example if you take tetanus we need to directly inject the preformed antibodies or antitoxin so that the effect of tetanus could be reduced this is the reason why in india the only government recommended vaccine for pregnant mothers is tt that is tetanus toxoid see so tetanus is a deadly infection which is also called as the locked jaw this disease generally occurs due to exposure to the bacteria called as clostridium tetani this exposure is generally caused by the injury or through some surgical procedures and when the body is exposed to the bacteria immediately causes disease by releasing toxins quickly and we know that childbirth involves the risk of uh, surgery and injury and that is why tt is recommended for the pregnant mothers now apart from tt other vaccines such as hepatitis vaccine are also recommended in western countries and now in the pandemic situation covid vaccines are also recommended to reduce the pregnancy related complications in the pregnant mothers so in india tt is the only government recommended vaccine for pregnant mothers remember this fact So now what are the list of compulsory vaccines recommended for the children after childbirth first among them is the BCG it is given at birth BCG is the bacillus calmet gerin this vaccine is given to immunize against the tuberculosis then hepatitis b vaccine is also given at birth but remember both bcg and hepatitis b vaccines are uh, injections but if you take the polio vaccine which is also given at birth it is a oral vaccine then another important vaccine is the rotavirus vaccine it is also given to the children after birth so rotavirus is something that causes a serious diarrhea around 80% of the disease occurs among infants who are less than 1 year old and in india especially around 80000 children die from rotavirus diarrhea annually so vaccine for this virus becomes important and that is why rotavirus vaccine is given to the children after birth then apart from this pneumococcal vaccine is also made compulsory then comes the most important pentavalent vaccine so pentavalent vaccine is a vaccine that contains five antigens that is diphtheria pertussis tetanus hepatitis b and haemophilus influenzae so this vaccine prevents all of these five diseases so if you go for pentavalent vaccine then there is no need to go for dpt and tt separately see dpt vaccine is for three diseases diphtheria pertussis and tetanus whereas this pentavalent vaccine is for five diseases including the dpt apart from this measles and japanese encephalitis vaccine is also recommended for children by the government so take note of all these important vaccines the most important ones are bcg hepatitis b oral polio vaccine then rotavirus vaccine then pentavalent vaccine keep these facts in mind these are very important from the 
preliminary perspective so now let us move on to the next discussion so with this news article discussion now we are moving to the next session which is the practice questions discussion in this session we will be taking few practice questions based on the areas which we covered in the news articles discussion so now let us take up this first question with reference to vaccines consider the following statements first statement principle of vaccination is based on memory of immune cells this statement is correct we saw this during discussion that the principle of vaccination or immunization is based on the memory of immune cells now the second statement is vaccines are a preparation of antibody proteins see this statement is incorrect because vaccines are a preparation of antigens not antibodies third statement antigens are produced in response to vaccines this statement is also incorrect because antibodies are produced in response to vaccines not the antigens the vaccines contain the proteins of the pathogens or even the inactivated or attenuated pathogens so here the question asks for the correct statements and only one statement is correct in this question which is statement 1 so the correct answer is option a one only so be careful while attending a question regarding antibodies and antigens the simple fact that you can remember regarding antigens and antibodies that an antigen is any substance that causes our immune system to produce antibodies against it now let us take up this next question it is a pair based question on one side festivals are given and on the other side tribes are given first pair is tai kamti sankhen second pair vancho oraya third pair idumishmi re and the question asks for the correctly matched pairs and from our discussion we can easily say that all these three pairs are correctly matched so the correct answer is option d 1 2 and 3 now look at this next question it is a two statement question it is based on our earth observation satellite discussion first statement says the payload fairing is an equipment used for protecting against the aerodynamic forces from the atmosphere this statement is correct we saw that this payload fairing is used for protecting the spacecraft and the third stage now the second statement is the ogive shaped payload fairing was flown for the first time in the pslv c45 this statement is incorrect because today's discussion mentioned that this payload fairing was used for the first time for launching the earth observation satellite 03 and this satellite will be launched using gslv f10 launcher and it is not pslv c45 now here the question asks for the incorrect statement statement 1 is correct and statement 2 is incorrect so the correct answer is option b 2 only so with this we have discussed three prelims practice questions now today we have only one mains question which is under gs paper 2 this question asks you to discuss the context of right to strike in india so while discussing the statement and about this right try to give certain examples so viewers we have come to the end of today's hindi news analysis and practice questions discussion session If you like this video don't forget to like comment and share and also subscribe to our channel for more updates related to civil services preparation thank you